Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And guys, I am almost nervous today with the guests that I've brought to you. So let me tell you a little bit about him, and you will understand why. I have got such a treat for you. Um, So today on the show, I'd like to welcome Bob Berg, co-author of the best-selling book, wait for it, The Go-Giver. Yes, I have one of the co-authors from The Go-Giver on the show with us today. Bob is an advocate, supporter, and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. His perspective provides new insights to the servant leadership idea, and his writing helps businesses more effectively communicate their value, sell at higher prices with less resistance, and grow their businesses based on endless referrals. Bob, thank you so much for being here today. Casey, it is great to be with you. I can already tell we are going to have so much fun in this conversation, Um, but I told you I had a story to tell you before we came on the podcast. So I'd like to tell you, I like to make connections for my audience about how I meet people. And so I want to let them know how I met you. And it was somebody that's following the very philosophy of the go-giver as as it's laid out in the book. And it was a gentleman that had come to my Rotary Club and we would do a raffle at the end of every uh, meal. And he uh, said, I want to add an extra gift this time. And the gift was the go-giver. And I did not win the book, and I was really upset about it because I love books. And he said, just give me your card. I'll mail you one. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. You know, he's a guest. I'll probably forget that. I'll just have to go get it. A couple of weeks later, I got the book in the mail. And I was like, you know what? I've got to read this one. I'm stopping. What I'm reading right now, I'm going to read it. And I was so glad I did. And then a little while later, he uh, asked me to go to lunch because he wanted some information about, you know, some of the social media stuff that I was doing. And I asked him, I said, why do you do that? And he goes, I think everybody should read this book. Wow. His name is Mike Romig. And I can't, he's given out more books than I have. So. Well, that is, that is so nice to, to know. That, that really is so nice to hear. Thank you. You are welcome. So, you know, I want to get right into the meat of this book. But, you know, I'm obviously when I read The Go-Giver, because I talk about it almost every podcast, it changed my approach to leadership. Um, can you share a little bit about the book for those who haven't read it and the premise for our listeners? Sure. It's a, a business parable. So it's a story. And while it's based on principles that are tried and true, it's, it's, uh, it is a work of fiction. Uh, co-authored by a great guy by the name of John David Mann, who is really the lead writer and the storyteller. You know, I'm a how-to guy. Every book before that and every book since that that I've written myself have been how-to books, step one, step two, step three. John is a magnificent storyteller. So it's really been a, a, a really an honor and a privilege to uh, get to co-author this with him. Uh, the basic premise, Casey, it's a, it's a great question. And it's I would say it's simply that that shifting your focus, and this is so key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, uh, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others. Uh, understanding that not only is that a, 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 a nicer, more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's also the most financially profitable way as well. Uh, not for some you know woo woo way out reasons or anything, but it actually makes makes very practical logical sense. When you're that person who can move your focus off of yourself and place it on solving others' problems, bringing them value, helping them achieve what they want, making their lives better in some way, well, people feel good about you. People begin to know you. They want to get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in relationship with you. They want to be a part of your your life, a part of your business. And so it really 
turns into a very mutually beneficial relationship. I I love that. And I want to stand up and applaud, but I'm afraid I'll knock something over (laughs) because that is so good. But I, and you know, and that's one of the things that I love about VIP. And I don't talk about the company very often, even though they sponsor this podcast, but VIP is the company that I work for as well. And um, this podcast was created so that we could give value first to our job seekers and to our clients. And very rarely do we say, hey, now come give us your business. Not very rarely, never, you know, do we say that because it is about giving value first and we know that it will, you know, come back to us because we're doing that. So I'd like to say that we're a go-giver company. I'm sure you are. I have no (laughs) doubt. So in your book, you and uh, John David Mann cover the five laws of stratospheric success, the laws that teach us how to open our lives to the power of giving. Can you kind of walk us through these five laws? Sure. So the laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The first one is the law of value. And this one says that your true worth, in the business sense, of course, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, when you first hear this, it's a little counterintuitive. Give Mm -hmm. more in value than I take in payment. I mean, that that sounds all nicey-nice and everything, but it also sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy. And so we, we simply have to understand the difference between price and value. Uh, price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's it's finite. It is what it is, right? Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings with it uh, so much worth or value to another human being that they will willingly exchange, in this case, in the business sense, exchange their money for it um, and be glad they did while you make a healthy profit. May I give you a quick example and we'll do it yeah. outside of your business. We'll just, we'll just take a generic business example Okay. that let's say you were to hire an accountant and this accountant charges you and we'll just name a round figure. She charges you a thousand dollars. That's her 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 fee, literally, it's her price, $1,000. But what value does she give you in exchange for this $1,000? Well, uh, through her hard work, her years of experience, her diligence, her getting to know you and, and discovering what you're looking to accomplish, learning about your business, she's able to save you $5,000 in taxes. She also saves you countless hours of time and she provides you and your family with the security and the peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. So again, we see that while price is finite, value can be both concrete in terms of that $5,000 savings. That's pretty easy to get our arms around, but it can also be conceptual in terms of the uh, peace of mind, which probably holds more value to you than even the the savings. So what she did is she gave you well over $5,000 in value in exchange for a thousand dollar fee or price. She gave you more in value than she took in payment. So you feel great about it, but she also made a very healthy profit, which she should, because to her, it was worthwhile. It was worth her time in, in her opinion to sell or lease her services for that thousand dollars. So in a And one of my old mentors, Harry Brown, taught me this, that in a free market-based exchange, and when I say free market, I simply mean no one is forced to do business with anyone else. People do business with one another on their own volition. In a free market-based exchange, uh, there are always two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits, because each of them come away better off afterwards than they were beforehand. Gotcha. So that's basically the law of value now. But here's the thing. This takes place because the accountant has either been able to effectively communicate herself or through someone who referred her. However, it happened. She's able to communicate that her focus is not on her feet. Her focus is on the immense value she provides her clients. And that's why someone chooses to do business with her. This is why John and I say that money is simply an echo of value. Money is an echo 
of value. It's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which really means nothing more, Casey, than that the value must come first. That must be the focus. Your focus on the other person bringing them value. The money you receive is simply a very natural result of the value you've provided. So that's law number one. Now I can breeze through the others easier. Law number one is kind of the foundational one. So it, that takes a little longer to set up. You take so, your time. I'm loving this. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. <laughs> law number two is the law of compensation. Now the law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with the exceptional value you provide, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. Uh, your accountant in the first example, she did a wonderful job of giving you more in value than what she took in payment. The chances are you feel great about her, you would do business with her again, and you would probably refer her to others. Uh, well, her other clients feel the same way. So our accountant is very quickly amassing an army of personal walking ambassadors, people singing her praises. And as she continues to add this kind of value to the lives of more and more people, her income will continue to grow and grow. In the story, <coughs> excuse me, Nicole Martin, the CEO, told Joe, the protege, that the law of value represents your potential income but it's not enough to serve just one person. Law number two represents your actual income because it's all about the number of lives you're able to impact through what you do. Well, and I love in that example with the CEO that it really kind of was brought to, it, it was explained very well because she was a teacher before and she could only touch 22 to 25 lives at a time. And she had always wondered why she was doing such a great thing, but these actors were making way more money than her, right? So exactly, exactly. And so she, what she did is she she was able to uh, expand her reach. She was uh, so so she she leveraged her value, right? And she mm -hmm. and she expanded her reach and was able to touch the lives of so many more people with that exceptional value. That is. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So law number three is the law of influence. And the law of influence says that your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Uh, again, you know, it sounds sort of counterintuitive, right? Or even counterproductive, maybe even uh, Pollyanna-ish, right? And yet the greatest leaders that you know and that I know, the top influencers, the, the most consistent, highest money earning salespeople and entrepreneurs, this is how they live their lives and conduct their businesses. They're always looking out for the other person's interests. Now, I wanna clarify that and qualify that if I may, because I, I think this can easily be misunderstood and I think it's very important. And that is that when we say place the other person's interests first, we don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or a martyr Mm -hmm. or self-sacrificial in any way. Absolutely not at all. It's simply understanding as Joe, the protege was, was taught by several of the mentors, the golden rule of business, of sales, of networking, what have you, is simply that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And uh, there's no faster, more powerful or more effective way to elicit those types of feelings toward you in others than by genuinely moving from an I focus or me focus to an other focus, looking for ways to, as Sam, one of the mentors in the story advised Joe, to make your win all about the other person's win. That's how one acquires influence. Law number four is the law of authenticity. And this one says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. In this chapter, uh, Deborah, the uh, uh, very successful realtor, she shared a lesson that, that she learned fortunately uh, in, in her career. And that is that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and they are indeed all very, very important. They're also all for naught if, you don't come at it from your true authentic core. However, 
when you do, when you, as we like to say, show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel good about you. They feel comfortable with you. They feel safe with you. Why not? They know who they're getting, right? They, they know who you are. That's how you, you show up the same way. Uh, they begin to know you. They like you. They love you. They trust you. They're much more likely, again, to want to be in relationship with you, do business with you, refer you to others. Um, which kind of begs the question then, if if showing up authentically is is so good for business, which it is, why do some people not show up authentically? Instead, they kind of show up as a, um, I guess the correct Latin term would be phonus balonus. <laughs> themselves. And, you know, I think it's easy to default to the, well, they're just not honest or they're crooked or they're trying to pull. Uh, well, it's a big world. There's people like that. But uh, generally speaking, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think 99 times out of 100, when someone does not show up authentically, it's really because they don't have the self-confidence to do so. And or maybe the safe space. Exactly, exactly. And let's face it, it's it's difficult to show up authentically when you don't feel you have anything worthy of showing up for, or when, again, you don't maybe, uh, that, that when you talk about the safe, say it's just safer to not show yourself, right? And so I, I think we have to, as human beings, recognize the importance of, of embracing our value is what it comes down to, our authentic value what we're about. Now, I think as human beings, we all have two types of value. We have intrinsic value just by being human beings, we bring value to the table. But we also have what I call market value. And I define market value as that combination of strengths, traits, talents, and characteristics that allows someone to add value, bring value, give value to the marketplace in a way that they will be rewarded financially. And we all have those aspects uh, of, of, of value, those strengths that we have. But here's the problem. We're human beings. And as human beings, we're so emotionally close to ourselves, we don't necessarily see those, those elements of value mm -hmm. that we bring to the table, right? We don't see our strength as being strength. Sometimes we just think, well, we can do it. Everyone can do it, right? Because that's all we know. It's, we see the world from our own set of beliefs. Or we, you know, we undervalue ourselves or, or, you know, we've grown up with people telling us that we were not authentically worthy or, and even if they didn't use those words, that's how we felt or for whatever reason it is. And that's why I think it's so important to get with someone who can, and it can be someone informally or formally, however you do it, but to get with someone who knows you well enough that they can help you really identify those strengths that you have and to be able to embrace it. The trick is that it's got to be someone who cares about you, but not someone so emotionally close to you that they also can, you know. <laughs> but I think that's really what it comes down to is, is we now we've got to understand our weaknesses too, and we all have those. Right. You know, I group weaknesses into three different areas. There are the weaknesses that we can ignore because they're just not important. Like for me, I run slow. And don't run long distance as well. That's a weakness. But at 62 years old, not planning on running a marathon or a dash, I don't care. I, I ignore that weakness. Okay. Then there are the weaknesses we need to mitigate. Okay. I'm not particularly good with numbers. I don't have a great business sense. So I was never going to be an accountant and never going to be someone who dealt in, in that kind, you know, in mergers and acquisitions. But I learned enough that I know how to run a business and that, you know, I mean, I surround myself with good people, but that I know enough that, you know, so that's a, something to mitigate. Then there are those weaknesses that we really do need to turn into strengths if we're going to be as effective as we can be. You know, sometimes I think people utilize the word authenticity as an excuse for not, not growing. Uh, it, it's like the person who says, well, I have anger issues and I yell a lot. And if I were to act any differently, that wouldn't be authentic of me. And of course, we know that's hogwash, right? That's baloney. It simply means that person has an authentic problem that they need to authentically work on in order to become a higher, better, more effective, authentic version of them 
themselves. Okay, so so there are those weaknesses, and we need to know which are what and, and what we need to do. But we need to really be able to identify and embrace our strengths in order to show up authentically. We lead with our strengths, and you know that's really what the law of authenticity is is all about. And then the final one is the law of receptivity. And this one says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And this really means nothing more than understanding that, yes, you breathe out, but you've also got to breathe in in order to survive, in order to thrive, right? It's not one or the other, it's both. Uh, you breathe out, which you breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen. You breathe out, which is giving, and you breathe in, which is receiving. And despite the messages we receive from the world around us when it comes to money, prosperity, wealth, abundance, and we don't receive mixed messages from the world around us, we receive negative messages from the world around us. Despite those messages, it's important to understand that giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. They're simply two sides of the very same coin and they work together in tandem. It's not a matter of are you a giver or a receiver. That's the treacherous dichotomy. No, absolutely not. You're a giver and a receiver. You also know that the focus needs to be on the giving. That's how you create that benevolent context for success. And you need to be able to allow yourself to receive as the result. Wow. <laughs> Mic drop. You know, <laughs> that was awesome. And like, literally I'm, that was like my second question and we're going to run out of time, but I do want to ask you a couple more questions before we run out of time. But I wanted, also wanted to share that when it comes to giving, you know, I, I see myself as a giver. That's my one word. Everything I do has to focus around giving. The piece I was missing was the receiving I was not a good receiver at all. And I think it was holding me back. And so now I, you know, sometimes I'm still, when people want to do stuff for me, I'm kind of like, oh, let me do something for you first. And, but, but I'm really outgrowing that mindset and really just embracing the receiving and trying to receive with grace and trying to teach others to do that as well. So that was, I think that was the piece I was missing. So thank you. You know, I mean, it takes practice. Once we understand that's an issue, you know, before we understand something's an issue, we're not going to work on it. Right. It's only when we grab that it's an issue. Then we can proactively work on it. And that's why I, you know, to this day, because I had to get past that as well. Uh, and to this day, I read books on prosperity. I read books by Randy Gage, David Nagel, Bob Proctor, Ellen Rogan, you know, uh, uh, Stuart Wilde, all the people who write these wonderful, you know, books on prosperity because we get all this garbage from the world around us uh rich people are evil and this and that and all these you know horrible things um you're in dallas when you know when i was a kid it was J.R. ewing in of <laughs> dallas the epitome of the evil capitalist who just cared right you know um i mean there's all sorts of people in the world but you know by and large especially to the degree that no one's forced to do business with you the only way you can make a lot of money is to to serve a lot of people and serve them very well so, you know, I, I listen to uh, podcasts, blogs, uh, anything to, to keep the positivity in terms of prosperity flowing into my mind because the garbage, the negative messages, they come at us from everywhere, you know? So I think it's very, very important. Well, and I love that you share that information that you don't make it an ugly thing to make money, right? And that was one of the lessons of the CEO. I think it was the CEO. She Absolutely. had that. She said, you can't be good and have money. Right. That was what she had to get. That's what she grew up with, which yeah. a lot of people grow up with. You know, I love what Rabbi Daniel Lappin says about about receiving about money. He says he says money is a um, oh, what do you say no, is a note of thanks from a happy person. OK, because you serve someone. In the I like that. Uh, again, when, when, uh, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, and, and we, we see all the times uh, with with big business or special interest where they actually and it's called cronyism, where they, through their, through their lobbyist on K Street, they actually buy the influence of politicians to have special rules and regulations made. That is not capitalism. That is cronyism. It's a whole different thing. 
Huh. Capitalism, free market capitalism, is where people are free to buy, sell, trade with one another voluntarily. And the only way you can make money in a truly capitalist society is by providing value to others because remember and i say this when i to, when i speak at sales and leadership conferences nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet they're not going to buy from you because you need the money or even because you're a nice person but because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so i the go love that is that that is i love that i'm going to start using that nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota so I love that, you know, and I tell my sales team all the time, I'm like, and you know, we're a hundred percent commission. And I tell them all the time, I'm like, you give value first, give value first, the money will follow. It can't help, but follow. So that's right. Yeah, it can't help, but follow. Exactly. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so the, how does a go-giver mindset act as a competitive age edge for like job seekers? How, how is this going to help job seekers? Mm-hmm. So there's a few different ways. And, and one, when it comes to just the job market, you know, the, and especially the, you know, as you know, most jobs are found through the hidden job market. I yep. mean, basically, they're not, you know, they're not from want ads. Okay. They're, and so it's knowing the right people and it's knowing who can connect and who can, well, how does that begin? If you just go up to someone and say, hey, I need a job. Can you help me find one? That's probably not, you know, unless you talk to a firm who actually does that. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> You know, but uh, but it's connecting with someone in a way that you are communicating value to them first and that you're looking for how you can help them in some way and develop a relationship with 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 people. Because and, and you know, to the degree that you build these relationships before you need them, as Harvey McKay used to say, dig your well before you're thirsty, which was the title of one of his books. Um, you know, then when you when you have that, and even then, I still wouldn't necessarily approach people saying, "Do you know uh, where I can get a job?" But I, but depending upon the kind of uh, job you want to have, the kind of um, industry you want to be in, it's maybe asking for an introduction to someone who can mm -hmm. provide you with some advice. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and then after you talk to that person, making sure to send a handwritten thank you note to that person, simply thanking them for their time. Now, obviously, when you're talking to, a, you know, when it comes to a search firm or it comes to someone who are consulting as, as you are, it's the same thing. It's letting, the, it's letting the people on your team know why they would be a great candidate for someone else. Yep. And when you have the interview, it's preparing ahead of time, so much so understanding the culture understanding their their you know their their strengths their weaknesses their opportunities and their threats it's understanding as much as you can so even in the interview you're able to communicate that your your desire is to bring value to their enterprise absolutely that is awesome Wow. I am just over the moon with this conversation and I appreciate you so much. And before I get to the VIP questions, um, how do people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you? Probably the best way is, is at my uh, website, Berg, B -U -R -G com, and they can um, uh, get a chapter of any of my books and they can go to the video blog and there's lots of resources there. And you're pretty active on LinkedIn as well, aren't you? Yeah, I'm on several of the social media. LinkedIn is a, a, a big one for me. Uh, I find that to be a great community. Yeah, I think that's how I actually contacted you was through LinkedIn and how we started a conversation. So yeah, you know, it's why I, I consider ourselves such good friends by now. You know, when, usually when you're good friends with someone, you forget how you first met them. You yeah, because you feel. Like that is so sweet. I love that. And I just, we have to give a shout out to Jenny Antondo too, because she is our, one of our local celebrities. She also records here in the same studio that I do. So I almost feel like almost celebrity just being next to her. So, and that's awesome. And you two happen to be really good friends. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm friends with her, with, with her family and they're just delightful people. And we usually get, when I'm in town, when I'm in Dallas speaking, we usually get together for dinner and, and it's always a, always a treat for me. Well, I want to know the next time you're in town. Absolutely. You're so. joining us. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, There's awesome. another uh, speaker too. Uh, her name is uh, Shannon uh, McCain 
and she usually joins us as well. And she she's a great uh, she's an awesome speaker. She's a former uh, former Kansas City uh, Chiefs uh, cheerleader years ago, who then became an entrepreneur, and now she's a speaker who just does a, a magnificent job. So she usually joins us as well. And awesome. so we'll have a, a you know we'll have a, a bigger group next time. We'll have have you joining us, and we would love that. I would love that too. Are you ready for the VIP questions? I don't know. I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? Well, I would take my library. I love your library, by the way. So jealous. Yeah, this is, I always say my, my house is comprised of books with some scattered furniture. There you go. <laughs> Let's see. Um... Okay, so my library. Now, this is aside from family and, and things like that. No, nope, that so, includes family. Okay. Um, oh, and, but there's only three that I yeah. be. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, I would take my mommy and daddy with me. And I guess those are, that's three. I was going to say, is, are, are you trying to get one by me and make those a unit? My, cat, my little cat, Calvin, I have to leave him. I'll leave him with Diane. Okay. Uh, she's my trainer and, and she loves him and, and, and he loves her. And so she'll, she'll take care while I'm on the, while I'm on Mars. We're already making plans, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really, a, I don't really like to travel a lot. So I think I would turn down the Mars gig actually. Oh, you're the first one to turn it down. Oh, I would. Uh, absolutely. I would rather, you know, kind of just, just hear about someone else's travels to, to Mars. I like that. Okay. Okay. I would turn it down. I just figured I had to ask the question and come up with, with, with some names. I like that. You took a totally different spin on it. So um, so what is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? Well, uh, Diane, my trainer, she comes over early in the morning, and whether I like it or not, and I have to work out. And I say have to because that's one of those weaknesses I talked about. You know that I have to be mitigated. I couldn't ignore it, or I'd be in big trouble because I could live on, or maybe not live on, but you know, junk food uh, and uh, not working out. <laughs> Two of my favorite things: junk food and not working out. <laughs> uh, that's a weakness I couldn't ignore. Uh, but I also don't want to be a health fanatic either because it's not what I want to do, and so I do need to mitigate it. So because of that, I uh, she comes over. It used to be six mornings a week. Now it's five mornings a week. She also, after our workout, prepares all my meals for the day, and so I know what I can eat and what I can't. And um, so what I did is I kind of created an environment of, of self-discipline because I just didn't feel I was self-disciplined enough. Well, in my younger days, I was self-disciplined. I did it without, but now I know I wouldn't if she didn't show up. That is awesome. I need to meet this lady. Well, I need, I, I need I, Diane. I need other answers than you, than you want though. I no, you're answer. fine. You talk all you want. This is your moment. So, um, so my final question, if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? He did his best to make others feel genuinely good about themselves. I love it. I love it. You know, Bob, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been an honor and just, like I said, I'm over the moon with this conversation. So it was a real treat to have you on today. The treat was mine. The pleasure was mine. Thank you. Well, I just have one more thing to say to you, other than I'd like for you to come back because I didn't get through all my questions, but <laughs> one thing to say to you, and that's you are a VIP. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.